It's kind of a tough act to follow there. Hashtag astronaut. Um, my name is Vanessa Raymond. I work at the Geographic Information Network of Alaska, which is part of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And that's just way too many words and way too many syllables. Um, so we call it Gina. And you know, you guys are OpenStreetMaps, so I didn't want to talk specifically about the mapathons that we're doing because they look like mapathons that I'm sure you all have run and attended. Um, but I will talk instead about sort of why we need to do mapathons in Alaska and how we're incubating a mapping community um, there because of a variety of needs. Let's see. Okay, so first off, a little bit about my organization. Um, we process and distribute satellite imagery. So basically, a satellite flies over, we grab it through direct readout, and then we distribute it to our partners at NOAA and the Weather Service, Fire Service, um, a lot of operational users. But also, we serve it to our university, and researchers there do you know, myriad different things with it. So that's our uh, little dish there. Um, if you can see, the green mask is our station mask. So basically, we're getting anything in that area. So we get a lot of the, the polls. Um, and we do a lot of business, so we, we deliver, I think, over 1,200 products a day to our operational users, and that doesn't include other maps, other images that we distribute. So we're doing um, a lot of work. Well, our, our technologies and our softwares are doing a lot of work. Um, and besides that, we get to capture some really pretty pictures. So this is the Aurora from space, and it's using uh, a combination called the day-night band, which uh, picks up low light. So I don't know if you guys can see it, but sort of the, the green um, like dots are our, our centers of a population. So we've got Anchorage in the south, Fairbanks where I live in the middle. And up in the top, it's kind of hidden underneath um, some of the aurora is Prudhoe Bay where they extract a lot of oil. Um, so yeah, aurora from space. In Alaska, we face a lot of interesting challenges that I think people, when they think about mapping the United States, they don't think about um, these types of challenges. So I wanted to take a minute to talk about them with you guys. Um, we have remote areas with little infrastructure and low population, but those people still matter. So we still need to um, be able to get goods to them and provide them health care and education and all these sorts of things. So um, we actually don't have roads to all of our communities. A lot of people fly in and out. So some of the communities that we've mapped are, are fly-in communities. Um, we have the tyranny of distance. That's literally what we call it. Um, it's an extremely vast terrain. We have a lot of communities that historically don't have any access to what we call a cash economy. They're living a subsistence lifestyle, so people are hunting um, for what they eat and using you know, animal skins for what they wear, et, et cetera. Of course, that's changing nowadays, but there's still a historical relationship to the land and not to um, these sort of, the, the cash economy. And then we are experiencing climate change at twice the rate of the rest of the world. So um, we've got extremely vulnerable populations experiencing like coastal erosion, extreme weather events in Alaska, which is already an extreme weather event in of itself. So, um, and then we have people, again, living off the land. So not only are they kind of like, hey, wow, everything's different, but I also still need to go get caribou to eat. I still need to get a whale from my community to eat. So it's, um, there are a lot of complexity and nuance to how we operate in Alaska that I think are, aren't obvious if you're an outsider. So these are two products that um, we create for researchers and community members. One. Uh, is radar, and it's looking at land fast sea ice. So that's sea ice that's attached to the land for most of the year. But at a certain point, that um, you know, in the in the spring, it's warming, it breaks off, and people use that ice to go out and hunt. But then at, they also need to know when is it going to break off because we don't want to be on the ice at that point. So we use radar to help people predict not only when it's going to break off, but where that ice is going. And we've actually had hunters um, on the ice during a breakoff event, and they use this product to find where they went, because the, that part that you see that's white um, kind of scattered, and then they're like, okay, we can see some dark dots on this one that's going that way, and they got the hunters. Um, another product that we create is um, sea ice extent. So Alaska is cloudy, icy, and snowy. Those are all white things, and if you're using remote sensing, you can't discriminate. So we created this band combination um, where pink is clouds and blue is ice and snow. 
And that's really helpful for our forecasters and also emergency responders. Um, we do some other, we do a lot, but just briefly, we also monitor volcano ash, um, smoke, and we have a lot of forest fires. And again, I mentioned people are flying in and out of communities, um, and you can't fly when there's a lot of smoke or a lot of ash. So these are sort of um, protecting life and property uh, ways that we use remote sensing in Alaska. And my organization is community is committed to technology that supports the public good for Alaska and the US Arctic. And we also are interested in making geospatial data available to people who need it at the time they need it in the format they need it. So we're very interested in open source communities, um, interoperable endpoints and all of this sort of stuff. And this is another sort of rescue mission. This is NOAA, um, the weather service, used our day night band to find a fishing boat that was lost in the sea ice. And we used it because we can see the lights. So you can see the crab fleet. And they can um, see the ice edge. They can see anchorage. And they saw one little dot, the Kiska Sea. And they said, hey, guys, like go the other way. Um, you're going into the ice as opposed to away from it. And that was another rescue uh, operation that we were a small part of. And then as I was coming down here, um, it was Alaska Day. Uh, Alaska became a territory 150 years ago. And I'm not, I'm not paid by Matthew Felling, <laughs> but he did have some very pithy um, tweets on the 18th. So, okay, um, if you were to fly from Atlanta to San Diego, you would still be in Alaska. Um, Alaska's coastline, the state, is longer than all of the other coastlines in the United States. And we've got 29 volcanoes. We've got, we're still, tw if you cut us in half, we'd still be twice as big. We'd still be state one and two in terms of size. And then you'd have Texas. So tes tes sorry, uh, Texans, we're coming for you. Um, and another thing, this is a shout out to Ian and Alan on the Slack channel, the OSN Slack. Um, They're talking about sort of um, native territories. And there's this cool map that someone made. I think they're Canadian. But it reminded me that in Alaska, we also have um, indigenous people in a very high percentage in our state. That, that complicates our land claim, our land use, um, historical like movements of people. And so this is a map of the languages um, that are in our state, the Alaska Native languages. And that's another thing that people don't often think of when they're not from Alaska, um, that we have sort of layers of complexity to our land management. So to the topic at hand, um, we do all of this remote sensing, but we wanted to bring it to the community level. And so we started running mapathons with OpenStreetMaps. And we have a lot of partners that I have to mention. Um, NSF EPSCOR Alaska, American Red Cross Alaska, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, Federal Division, and the city of Fairbanks. Um, OK, so. The first one we did was in Delta Junction. It's a part of the unorganized borough, and you can see that in red. Um, so the unorganized borough is about the size of Texas, and it's called unorganized. So you can imagine that mapping is something that's needed here. Um, <clears throat> Delta Junction is, so these are some screen grabs from our projects, um, is in orange. And Fairbanks is up there, right, left, in the right, in the left and I live in Fairbanks, that's 100 miles away. Their dispatch is in Fairbanks, so if they have an issue, um, they have to call us, and we have to send someone. But they are not mapped, and our dispatch people don't know, like, Aunt Sally's house by the roadhouse. Like, okay, they might, because we all go to that roadhouse, but um, <clears throat> there's, there's a reason why we needed to map this, and so the emergency managers of our city, Red Cross, and, and our group, who is specializes in mapping, got together and mapped Delta Junction. Um, and this is one of the men who's a part of this. He's the GIS manager at our borough, Bill Whitty. He used to be a firefighter, and he's like, I've seen this happen where we have an address that doesn't make any sense, that the road to the place doesn't exist, um, and people die. You know what I mean? Like there are minutes matter in situations like this. And I grabbed a screen grab from a dispatch text from this summer. And thankfully, there it, not thankfully, but there was a rollover and it was on the highway. Um, and people know, oh, mile 231. You go to that mile. But if it hadn't been on the highway, if it had been somewhere in 
let's say this area, um, there wouldn't have been an easy way to get there. And then those people need to be um, driven back to Fairbanks where we have hospitals. So, so minutes can really add up. Um, this is an example of, well, you probably can't see it right now, but um, an area that's been mapped, an area that hasn't been mapped in Delta Junction. And you can see even the roads don't really ma match. Um, there's a lot of new development. There's a lot of sort of ad hoc development that we experience in Alaska because one thing you should know is Alaskans don't like rules and they don't like the federal government. So they're like, we're gonna do what we want. You know, this is my land. And um, that, that is difficult when you're trying to um, be of service. So um, another mapathon we did was in the North Slope. That's the red part at the top. They are literally at the top of the world. And the communities are Anaktuvik Pass, Atkwasak, Kaktovik, Nuiqsit, Point Hope, Point Lay, Utgyavik, which used to be Barrow, or was for a short time Barrow, and then Wainwright. And um, we wanted to do a mapathon for these communities because, first of all, we worked with students in the North Slope, and we thought they'd be able to bring a lot of their own um, understanding of their community to the mapping process. And second of all, we wanted to do some preventative mapping. So these are communities that are, are experiencing climate change at twice the rate of the rest of the world because they're in the Arctic. Um, so they have, they're on the coast, coastal erosion, and then extreme weather events, and then ad hoc development, and a boom bust economy because we are based in sort of oil extraction. So sometimes everyone's like, let's build everything. We're gonna drill. And then they're like, no, there's no more money. Everybody leave. Um, and that really creates havoc for mapping for the people who stay behind and for emergency response. So I wanted to show some pictures because I was guessing that very few of you have been to these communities. Um, correct me if I'm wrong and I can skip over the pictures. But this is Point Lay. And this is a, a fisher working on the coast. Um, this is a screen grab from our, our mapathon, one of the areas we were mapping, Point Lay. And so you can see that the ice is right at the edge of this community. And this community is in the middle of nowhere. And I don't, I don't, I mean, that's true. Like it really is in the middle of nowhere. And so if a crazy storm comes, um, if this ice kind of bunch, like bunching up against the coastline erodes it and these buildings start to fall into the sea, et cetera. They don't have maps. Um, they also have emergency dispatch that isn't anywhere near where they are. These communities don't have roads into them. They don't have police officers. They don't have hospitals. So um, these are the reasons why we wanted to map them. Um, OK, this may be a difficult image for some of you, but um, this is Kaktovik. And this is a whale hunt from last year. Um, this whale will feed everyone in that picture and everyone that they know. So this is a huge thing. Um, a bag of chips in a community like Kaktovik could cost, sorry, like $12. Um, milk can cost like $30. So this is sustainable, this is traditional, and um, this is like cost-effective food for people. It's really healthy. Um, so this is Kaktovik, and you can see there's sort of a lot of desolation. The, the community is a little bit farther off the image, but I wanted to show the coastline because it's, again, close, it's desolate, and you can see that there was industrial development and then it's gone, and you know, oil companies will come and go when it's advantageous to them, but the people remain and they still have to make everything work. Um, and then this is a picture of the, the community of Kaktovik, and as you can see, these are like, this is temporary housing. Um, it is, um, these are not mansions, and if these people need to move, um, they may not have the personal resources to do that easily. And also, getting anything to these communities is expensive in of itself. So you can't just order more wood. Um, that's, that's a huge cost. So these are some of the reasons why we have been doing mapathons. Um, there's also thawing permafrost. Permafrost is frozen ground for, I don't know, simplicity's sake and it's thawing, so things that have historically been frozen and solid are now kind of like wonky and squishy and wet, and that doesn't make for good roads or sewage, water lines, um, things like that. And then we also have a lot more fire events, and so fire trucks have to come in from out outside of town, um, and that com complicates things. Um, this is Utgyavik, or Barrow, 
It's the biggest community in the North Slope of Alaska. 4,000 people live there. This is a screen grab from our Mapathon event. And as you can see, even though it's larger and more organized, um, it's surrounded by, you know, the, I, the ocean on one side covered in ice and then like ice lagoons. It's, it's um, precarious. And these are some um, kids in Utqiavik watching a competition, a, a rowing competition. But even the ice is less stable, so, so nothing is um, as it was in these communities, and that makes them more vulnerable. And then these are some pictures of our Mapathon. We're like a super small group, so um, I see other people's Mapathons like, uh, you know, online or in the news, and there's like hundreds of people there. <laughs> and this is us. Uh, we're in our Decision Theater North, which is these seven screens. This is this immersive environment. And um, this is sort of a, a picture of our, all of our finished maps from the North Slope Mapathon. Um, we have remote participants. I only have pictures of them looking really bored, but I realized um, when you're mapping, like you're not, ha you don't have the most engaged face on. So I guess I probably couldn't have unless I forced um, a picture. So anyways, um, some outcomes that we are looking for and seeing is that we're engaging the community in mapping. Um, we're bringing our skills to our community. We are um, helping to bridge data gaps or a data bridge. I don't know if that's a term that people use, but that's why I wrote here. Um, between the university and emergency responders and community members, which to us is like a total win. And introducing people to our immersive space and then incubating this sort of burgeoning network. And we've seen that now people are like, oh, I couldn't come to the last Mapathon, but here I am, I've never done this before. And that's really inspiring to us. And so we were able to help with hot OSMs, Puerto Rico mapping, um, and that was very, very cool that people kind of knew now what the idea is. And we're at this sort of baby step level where we're introducing the concept and getting people to feel um, comfortable asking questions like, what is it? How do I do it? Um, so yeah, this is from the newspaper and I had the, the journalist like map a, a building and she was pretty stoked about that. And then in terms of future plans, um, we're gonna map ice cellars. Ice cellars are these natural freezers that are in the permafrost. And because permafrost is thawing, um, they're not working anymore. And that whale goes in a ice cellar. And if you tr imagine putting that in a freezer, how many freezers would you need? And how much would that electricity cost in a community that doesn't have a lot of cash? So the ice cellars are really important and we wanna map them and then map which ones are failing and talk to the permafrost researchers and do some sort of um, integration there. We want to streamline and formalize the process for getting data out of OpenStreetMaps um, so that our emergency dispatch people can use it. And then we want to continue to kind of grow this community. That's us. Thank you to this is the sort of mosh pit of logos and that's all I got for you guys. Thank you, Vanessa. Are there any questions? In Alaska, capital, Tunio, there is no road, no road, no highway. Uh, in Tunio, you know, Alaska, capital, Tunio, there is no freeway to accumulate what will happen. Yeah, so we can't drive to our capital, Juno, it's an island. Um, but we also can't drive to a lot of communities, yeah. Uh, okay. If you, if, you, if you plan to build better highways, better roads, if you go to the Arctic in the future, the help. Uh, yeah, I don't know if they're planning on building new highways to the north. Um, they have one highway that goes there, and it's pretty good so far. It's holding up. Um, they are building some highways in the southeast of Alaska, but they're tricky. Um, they're very steep by the water, and so I guess building roads on steep places is hard. Sounds hard to me, but I I'm, don't work for DOT. That's why too much uh, permafrost, too much permafrost in the Alaska, but very difficult to build the previous electricity. Yep, so the permafrost and permafrost thaw makes it very complicated to build roads and infrastructure of any kind. In fact, even in my town, which is the second, or my city, second biggest city in Alaska, not everyone has running water. In fact, most people don't have running water. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 
Howdy. Uh, story goes, I was up in Southeast Alaska on this summer, super great. And the story goes as well is um, <clears throat> I was in some communities that didn't have a zip code and um, didn't have kind of the USPS um, way to get mail to them. And I'm wondering, like, if you, if a lot of these communities do have or don't have zip codes, and if they do, does that help you out? Like, if if they get a zip code from the USPS, does does the USPS now have to like map the area for you, or is that something that you would still have to do? That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure, um, but mail is also very complicated, as well as emergency dispatch and wa running water. <laughs> um, not everyone gets mail. Most people have to go to the post office or send cargo over planes, et cetera. Um, but that's a really good idea. I'm actually going to look into that. Thank you. I'm just going where the mic is. Sorry. <laughs> hey, you, uh, you mentioned that a lot of these communities are boomer bust, so I'm guessing there's a lot of like constant change. Um, have you seen like an increase in engagement since you've done these mapathons, like continuous editing, or have, has it really like improved that kind of continuous change detection, I guess? Uh, I haven't seen people going back over the same areas and adding them in, but I have seen people starting to be like, okay, we could map this, like this could be useful to us. And so we're at that stage, not the stage you're looking, you're talking about, but I would love to be at that stage soon. Yeah, um, because there is a lot of dynamic change. Mm -hmm. Hi, a, a lot of GIS analysts find themselves working with cultures that they don't understand and are coming in as outsiders. I was wondering if you had any parting advice for dealing with those challenging day-to-day -day nuances. Um, yeah, it is, it is a complex working environment. Um, in Alaska, a lot of people are over-researched and they don't want to give information to outsiders because it hasn't historically benefited their communities. Um, so I think going in with an understanding that um, this hasn't always worked out for the people that you're mapping um, and that level of empathy goes a long way. Um, and I think also asking people, like, what do you want? What do you want to call this? Where do you consider your boundaries of your community are or your hunting ground? And um, that will sort of um, get people to want to work with you. Of course, like BLM may come back and be like, hey, Vanessa, what are you doing here? That's not their town. Um, but it, you kind of have to pick and choose your battles, basically, is what I'm saying. Thank you. Sorry, we don't have any more time for questions, but maybe you can see Vanessa afterwards. Yeah, thank Thanks you very again. much, everybody.